A longtime broadcaster who's been in the boxing ring with more than 60 world champions and an Olympic gold medalist and basketball Hall of Famer, James Smitty Smith and Spencer Haywood are our guests this week on Nevada Week in Person Extra. Support for Nevada Week in Person is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt. Welcome to Nevada Week in Person Extra. I'm Amber Renee Dixon. Spencer Haywood is a pioneer in professional basketball, a health advocate, and once faced the Supreme Court. We'll have his story in just a few minutes, but first, James Smitty Smith has hosted the television show In This Corner for 20 years, and on it, not only does he interview world champion boxers, but he gets in the ring with them so they can demonstrate their moves. We talked to the Nevada Boxing Hall of Famer on all the work he does in the world of boxing. Tell me, when was it that you knew you wanted to get into broadcasting? You know, I think as a, a youngster growing up in, in Miami, um, my mom worked late and I would always watch Johnny Carson. Johnny Carson was, uh, you know, I idolized him. And, that is where the bug bit me. And then as I got into sports and it all transitioned, uh, I wanted to have my own radio show, which I did for many, many years in, in Southwest Florida and even national. And then that uh, set up the stage for the television career. You, know, you mentioned the show in this corner that has been on the air for 20 straight years. And I've called thousands of fights on TV and uh, documentaries and things also that I'm interested in, in in my future. But it started at a at a really young age. And it was the TV show that brought you to Vegas, right? Yeah, yeah I, I moved here in 1997 from Florida because I knew I had this idea uh, of doing boxing commentary, but I wanted my own show. And I figured there's no other place that I could get the athletes, the fighters, to be able to to do this type of thing, and uh, April the first, two thousand and four, we we launched on Direct TV, and somehow, some way, we've been on the air ever since. It was none other, though, going back to your childhood, <laughs> than the late great Muhammad Ali, who yeah. told you. When you said, I want to be a broadcaster, he said, yeah, I think you can do that. It was at the Fifth Street Gym. He was getting ready to fight Smoke and Joe Frazier in their first fight, uh, their epic fight, the most important, not just fight, but sporting event, March 8, 1971. We're at the Fifth Street Gym, and he uh, took a liking to me, and he, he let me go, and he was hitting the, the heavy bag and, and different things, and he said, little dude, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be like Johnny Carson and have my own television show. And I think Ali had just been on the Carson show, and he said, you will have your own TV show because you're just like me and Johnny. You never shut up, and the rest <laughs> is history. <laughs> but when he said that, it, it just, and that's why it's so important for kids to have positive role models because he made me believe that anything was possible. Another positive role model in your life was none other than great wide receiver Paul Warfield of yeah. the Miami Dolphins. How on earth did you make that connection? You know, and, and it's amazing. Paul and I to this day talk about it. He's like a father. He was like a father figure to me then, and he, and he still is. Um, you know, I became a ball boy for the 1972 Miami Dolphins, football's only perfect team. But I met Paul, and Paul knew that I was seeing Ali. They were both 29-year-old black men at the pinnacles. Ali, the most famous man in the world, Warfield, the best wide receiver, and they were both somehow smitten with Smitty. And Paul just loved to hear my stories about Ali in preparation for the, for the Frazier fight. And uh, that, that's kind of how it started. And Paul is the first one that put me on television. He had a, had a little a cable show, and he put me on there as a little kid. So it's, it's amazing how karma and all these things work out, fate maybe. And didn't you learn a very important lesson from him about uh, editing and what gets cut out? Yeah, I did, a, uh, <laughs> I did a piece with Howard Cosell called On Location, and Howard Cosell, who I idolized, came in, and they set it up that I would do a segment with Howard that it was about a 30-minute segment. We did trivia, and I beat him in trivia, and we talked, and then I wait. It was supposed to air the next uh, Sunday, and it was two episodes, and it didn't air. And then the next Sunday, the following Sunday, it didn't air, and I was in tears when I saw Paul. I said, they cut out my segment, and he said, well, Smitty, that's the way they cut the tape. So don't you cut the tape on this interview. <laughs> <laughs> if you're too loquacious, I might have to because of timing. Um, 
being part of that 72 mm. Dolphins team, the perfect team, only perfect team in football, what impact do you think that had on you in your later career as a sports broadcaster and the views you have on sports? Yeah, I was the one that Coach Shula told to flip off the lights so they could watch them, the, the Dolphins get beaten in, in Super Bowl VI by the Cowboys. And then I flipped the light back on and he made this speech about how it doesn't mean anything to get to a Super Bowl without ultimately winning it. And I just learned about work ethic. Uh, I, I, I learned about detail. Um, you know, I learned about confidence and, you know, sometimes not taking yourself so seriously, which I struggle with. But um, I, I learned so much and I still think that 72 team doesn't get the credit it deserves. It's all these years later. Nobody's ever going to beat it. They might, you know, replicate it. Um, uh, but but that that dolphin team being around Holly, and sometimes in the same day I'd be with Muhammad Ali because I'd skip school. Thank you, Mr. Wilson, for letting me do that. And I would be with the Dolphins in the afternoon. It was just an amazing ride that led to all of this. All right. So radio show first. Yeah. You venture a little bit into the WCW. <laughs> yeah. Well, WCW became one of my great sponsors of Smitty Sports Talk, and I used to, and I learned so much. I mean, I'm the one that really got Diamond Dallas Page in wrestling. Uh, it's a long story, but. I just learned so much about the mixture of sports and entertainment and how they blend. And I used to, to build my show, my radio show, as sports entertainment at its best, you know. And I got that. I got a lot of that from, from uh, wrestling and Captain Lou Albano. And uh, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, you move to Vegas. You start the TV show, the part where you get in the ring mm -hmm. with the fighters. You refer to them as in rings, and I think you're probably most well known for the one you did with Mike Tyson. Yeah, you think? Uh, yeah. <laughs> what do you remember? What do you remember about that one? Mike was still fighting professionally then, and he was. Um, I faced a much tougher Mike Tyson than Jake Paul will face. Mike was still fighting professionally, and uh, I, I, it, the funny story to us, I had a bridge, and Mike has heavy hands, and of course he wasn't trying to hurt me, I wouldn't be here with you, but he tapped me and the bridge fell out after the, <laughs> after the, uh, the interview, but it, it was intimidating um, y y just to see Mike, but I'm so grateful that all those great athletes let me in, and, they let, and this is not a, a BS segment. They really, as you know, take it seriously, and at, at a high level, uh, boxing is our artistic brutality and we try to explain the artistry of it. And perhaps you will uh, tell the story of how impactful that in-ring segment can be. Uh, what was Andre Ward's message to you when he first met you? Yeah, it was uh, Andre Ward and, 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 and Tim Bradley, who, who I haven't, sorry Tim, we haven't done a, a show with him yet. Um, Andre came up to me, I was uh, covering a fight and he tapped me on the shoulder and he says, hey, when do I get to be on your show? And I said, well, we certainly want, you're one of my top fighters. And he says, no, I can't wait to do the in-ring. And so after uh, five, six, seven years of doing it, then the fighters started seeking me out and wanting to do uh, the in-rings uh, with, with me. The last one I did was with Devin Haney, but I am, I still have a few left in me. Oh, well, you already answered a question that I was <laughs> going to ask, but uh, do you have a favorite in-ring that you've done? I think Amber of all time, it might be Bernard Hopkins because, you know, he went on uh, the ageless wonder He's the only guy that maybe has almost a draw with Father Time, but because he went into not just the intricacies, but the extricacies, which is not a word. In other words, he explained what he did that wasn't legal. Yeah, the Think, dirty the tactics. The dirty tactics, and so, and, and I just really appreciated his honesty and candor, uh, and he, he beat up on my, the, 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 uh, the sides of my legs and my, uh, my back, which are illegal, but later on that next time, so now I see why he did that. Yeah, you know? <laughs> well, and imagine how many fighters watch that and learn from yes. it. Yeah, to this day, fighters, when I, everywhere I go, all over the world, there are people that said, oh, you know, they, they know me more from my YouTube videos with Floyd Mayweather, Manny Pacquiao, Ricky Hatton, and the like. Okay, uh, how often do fighters get more physical than you would like? A few of them that, I, that when you know them too well, Jeff Finnick beat the hell out of me uh, purposefully, and, and um, Roberto Duran bloodied my nose, and it was because he was speaking in Spanish, and I thought he said, and this is why I should have learned Spanish when I was growing up in Miami, he said, I think, go left, and I went right, and boom, and he, yeah. <laughs> and what about at the International Boxing Hall of Fame? Who was it that... Uh, oh, Sugar Ray Leonard. Yeah. Nailed me with a crisp left hook, but 
being the entertainer and spontaneous guy that I am, he hit me and right away I said, no moss, no moss, off the Roberto, Roberto Duran Dan. second fight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you also take a lot of pride in the interview part of that show. What are you looking to accomplish in those interviews? What allows you to say, I did a good job there? When the fighter is, is honest and, and really gets off all the BS, all the stuff that we see with stare downs and weigh ins and, you know, when they just are honest and they reflect at, at, at the highest point, the great fighters, they're chasing an altogether different type of ghost than any other athlete. Uh, they come from the greatest ones from the other side of the tracks, from where the buses don't run. And I'm looking for that candor. And uh, it got to a point later on in my career where almost everyone I would have on would cry. You know, I used to make them laugh in the beginning and then cry now. Or, but you just want to take them to a depth that maybe they haven't been to with an, interv uh, with an interview because so many of the, the, the guys doing box and gals doing boxing today don't know what they're doing. I know you have said that you earned their respect by having been a professional boxer yourself. How would Why you are you laughing when you refer to me as a professional boxer? Well, how would you describe your professional boxing Laughable. career? Well, it was I mean, I had no amateur fights. I went right in there to the Fifth Street gym thinking I could be like Ali and got the hell beat out of me a bunch of times. I had, you know, I never got knocked down, never got knocked out, but that's because I ran like hell. I was a great athlete. But in, in not knowing the sport and never having an amateur career, that is really what fueled me to get in the ring with these guys because now, even at my age now, I'm probably better. I couldn't beat the 20-year-old Smitty, but I'm better than the 20 because I have the knowledge in it. And it really is, at its highest level, it is a sweet science. And uh, uh, th doing that and being an athlete certainly helped. Uh, you mentioned that you are not hanging up your gloves <laughs> in terms of in rings. However, an issue passionate to you is that fighters yeah. should retire at a certain time. But isn't that subjective? When I, is an appropriate time? I, I, I don't think so. I mean, not anymore. I host the Hall of Fame, the International Boxing Hall of Fame, and, and I see the damage that has been done. Almost every great fighter, they, they take, it, they take a, it, there's a toll taken on them that is not taken on other athletes, mainly upstairs. We see it with football, but with boxers, every great fighter is going to suffer. And I think it's so appropriate now they're making bigger money, get out and be able to at least enjoy what you've accomplished. Uh, so I, I'm one that really, and I'm very honest to the fighters, get out while you still can. What keeps them from getting out? I, I think it's, a, and it's, an, it's an addiction, like Mike Tyson said on my show. It's, yes, in the past it was the money, uh, but now it's also the limelight. It's like these lights. And you know, how do you get out of this once you've been a broadcaster? If we've all, you've never been out of work, but I, you panic when you get out of work, you know? I have and, been. And, <laughs> I'm just messing with you. But I'm saying it's an addiction and there's, I mean, and a fighter, again, goes into the ring nearly naked, and it's just something I can't even explain. It scared the hell out of me when I did it a few times, but at the highest level, it is what motivates them, and, and um, it's something special. And I don't want to lose that with all the crap going on in boxing today. Last thing, I know you're going to send this to your mama. Want to send her a message? Yeah, what would I say to, well, my mother always let me be, and you can see that, I just, she let me be who, <laughs> who I am, and uh, so, good to see you, Mom. Here's Amber. <laughs> James Smitty Smith, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Nevada Week in person. Thank you. When the NBA said he could not play, he fought his case all the way to the Supreme Court and won. Now, because of Spencer Haywood versus the National Basketball Association, Athletes can leave college early to play in the NBA or enter the league right out of high school. Spencer Haywood shared more about this with us in a 2023 interview. Been Let's, a long time. I know you mentioned to me off camera that I was your first interview in I was Las the Vegas. First I, interview in Las Vegas. I feel so honored. At USA Basketball. That's what we were there for. Yeah. Uh, and what were you doing there? You were there to meet. I was there to meet the that particular team, which was Kobe Bryant, uh, LeBron James, Chris Paul, and all of those guys, and and uh, Jerry Colangelo, who was the head of in uh, USA Basketball, and Mike Shostakovich, who was the coach, said. 
guys, I want you to meet Spencer Haywood. And it's like LeBron was like, ah, what did he do this time <laughs> that we're trying to do? <laughs> he says, well, no, he's the record holder <laughs> for the most points and the most rebounds for the Olympics. It's like, where is, why this guy is everywhere. We get ready to go. He has been there. <laughs> Well, you have That's been there blazing. and you have paved the way yes. for them. Yes. How so, beyond what I mentioned in the intro, and, and what guys are able to play because of you or started to play a lot earlier mm -hmm. than they used to be able to? Years ago, you had to wait for four years after your high school class had graduated before you could enter into the pros. I was in a situation where my mother was picking cotton for two dollars a day in the south down in Mississippi in the Delta and she could not survive another year. So I decided that uh, I had spent two years of college, I had went to the gold, went to the Olympics, had a gold medal. I needed to get my mother out of the cotton field so I followed suit against against the NBA for the rights to play. And they filed suit against me for an injunction not to play. And so the case kept maneuvering, maneuvering through all the way to the Supreme Court where I won that case uh, seven to two. And it was, you, you won under the Sherman Antitrust Act where Thurgood Marshall was one of the lead uh, justice. And he was speaking that you cannot I'll uh, stop a person in America from making a living, even though the NC2A and the NBA had their collusion situation as well as the ABA, so the American Basketball Association. So I was fighting all three of them. Because you had played one season in the ABA, yes, a spectacular the, season, winning Rookie of the Year and MVP, but you went to the NBA because you wanted to make some good money. I wanted to make some good money and um, because I had wiped out all of the records in the ABA. This is a little shade I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to play against Will Chamberlain, uh, Jerry West, Oscar Robertson, and all of the greats. So that was a little bit of a... I'm going to make you list of the greatest Lakers of all time in order coming up. we got to okay. get to that. But first, back to your mother picking cotton. You grew up picking cotton as mm -hmm. well. And you told me off camera you think it allowed you to become a better basketball player, how? Well, because what happened is your higher power, God as we know him, put you in situations where you think it is the worst, but it happens to be the best. Now, I was a cotton picker and I picked with both hands and I pulled a sack which weighed 100 pounds as a young, young, young man. And so it developed my legs and it developed my hand and eye coordination and it developed discipline and, and endurance because I would work from sun up to sun down. So whenever these, uh, these, these obstacles are thrown in front of you, there's an, a door that's open so you can benefit from it. So I benefit. My hands were great in the NBA. I had great hands. I had soft hands. I, you know, I could, I, could div I could play both sides with uh, left and right. So. There it is, from the cotton field. <laughs> and what do you think made you the person, the right person to fight the NBA all the way to the Supreme Court? I don't know. It was just, <laughs> again, you know, they are doing this movie of, of my life and we are writing the script. So they keep saying, wait a minute, how do you get to these places at this time? And I don't know, but I do know that it was a spiritual force that brought me at that point in time. So I'm just the conduit for all of these things. The Supreme Court case that you won established the hardship clause. So you mm -hmm. had to prove that you were in need of I money in, in order need, to play. Yes. But that hardship clause was removed and it led the way for players like who to enter the NBA? Well, you have, let's go back to Julius Irvin, George Gervin, Bob McAdoo, all of the players from the 70s all the way up through to the 80s, Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird. Then you go into the 90s, you know, in the 2000s with LeBron, James, Kobe, all of these players. So if you look at the, the actual numbers in terms of what has it created in terms of revenue, 
It has created over $36 billion in player salary. For the owners, it has created over $60 billion for the owners. And it has opened up the NBA for European players to come in. And if you notice, our last three MVPs, or maybe four, the last four times we had an MVP is not from the United States. So those players come in after one year of setting out as well, and they come into the league. Do you think you get enough credit for having accomplished that? No. Why not? Because, you know, when you fight against the system, they tag you as a revolutionary or someone else, and I was never that person. And also because they wouldn't put my name on my ruling, even though it is from the Supreme Court, Haywood versus the NBA, It has always been called the hardship, early entry, uh, one and done, lost souls, whatever, (laughs) but never the Spencer Haywood rule. And so that's why the movie is called The Spencer Haywood Rule. I'm glad you brought up that movie because Mm -hmm. you have also been played recently uh, in a drama series on HBO (laughs) by actor Wood Harris. And in that, uh, the cocaine addiction that you had at the time during the 1980s -hmm. with that dynasty of a Lakers team, Magic Johnson. uh, Green, (sighs) Norm Nixon, Michael Cooper, and I fell on my face. (laughs) But it, 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 it taught me something, and it taught me how to get up, brush myself off, and survive. Uh... This is 39 years of sobriety for me, and and I've also helped with uh, the NBA and all of his substance abuse programs, uh, talking with players. But that year was just a horrible year, and I the year when they the year 1980 when 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 we when we were going to the championship, and this movie that's on HBO right now, uh, what is it called? Showtime. Okay. Uh, well, one of whatever it is. Well, okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, the one that we were talking about on HBO was Winning Time. Winning Time, okay. yeah. And so uh, there was a lot of uh, problems with, you know, like Jerry West didn't like the way he was betrayed. Right. Uh, Magic didn't like the way he was betrayed. But here I am saying, hey, they told the truth on me. <laughs> <laughs> so you were okay I, with it because you told oh, yes, the Seattle Times that you had to have your psychologist on speed dial while watching yes, it. Yes, I did. Why? Because it was bringing up a lot of things that I kind of pushed aside. And so uh, all of a sudden now it's right on the big screen and Wood was playing me to the max and stuff that I I was like, you know, I don't want to see this. I don't want to see myself like this. I don't want my kids to see me like that. And then uh, as I was talking and she says, well, you know, that is part of your life. That's part of your legacy. That is part of who you are. Think about the people that you're going to help by them watching this film. So, okay. (laughs) What would your advice be to people watching right now battling addiction? Well, I mean, first and foremost, you're going to have to admit that you have that problem, or whatever the problem may be, and you have to admit it, and then you have to seek help. And there's help available now. There's so much help out here, and it's not a stigma in terms of getting help. And uh, so reach out, but you're going to have to have a spiritual base. I don't know what your religion is or what, what it could be, but that is the base of all of it. What brought you to Las Vegas, and what is the health work that you are doing right now, the advocacy? Well, I came to Las Vegas. We came here to do the All-Star Weekend. And I was like, whoa, this is a very nice place. So I got involved in developing real estate here. And I helped build the Smith Center, which is the Children's Museum. I did all of the floor in there. And I did the Army Reserve Center in Sloan. I did all of the floor in there. And as of lately, I want to build this retirement center in Las Vegas for the NBA and the WNBA players so that we will have a place when people do fall upon times, or not necessarily fall upon bad times, but to have a place to 
come and sit and just relax and get rid of it, just like the Screen Actors Guild in, uh, Law in Los Angeles. What would that look like? Retired NBA players hanging out, rooming somewhere? and Yeah, well, it's going to look great because <laughs> we're going to have an NBA team here in two and a half years. Why do you say that? Because you have in the collective bargaining agreement just reached by the NBA and the NBA Players Association that there's going to be a two expansion teams. One is the Seattle, Seattle Supersonics, and the other one is the Las Vegas, who do we call them, the Rattlers or whatever. Oh, well, you're breaking news, though, because <laughs> that's not for well, sure, Well, I mean, sure. I know it's not for sure, for sure, but then you got LeBron James who are, like, lobbying for this particular location. Yeah. And you have the A's are moving in here. You have the the Raiders are here. You have the Knights are here. This is the and the city, Aces. And the Aces, the champions. Uh -huh. So this is the city of champions. This is the city, the new city for sports is Las Vegas. Everybody want to be here. Okay, 30 seconds left. Uh, who are you picking to win the NBA Finals? The Lakers. Okay, and Who do I can't fix, finish second? Uh, okay, well... Uh, Denver. <laughs> top five uh, Lakers of all time. I would say Kareem, LeBron, Kobe, uh, Shaq, Wilt, and Jerry West. Spencer Haywood, thank you so much for joining thank Nevada you. Week in person. And to see more, go to VegasPBS.org slash Nevada Week.